I'm Joanna Shanks. I'm Emma Taylor. And this is Murder She Spoke. Hi Emma, how are you this week? I am very, very well. How are you? I'm good, yeah. So for our listeners, uh, you might have remembered recently, I think we had a promo on almost every episode, that we were at CrimeCon Glasgow on Saturday 16th of September and we had a lovely time. It was a great day. We met loads of people, we spoke to loads of people, we did a panel at the end which was mildly terrifying but it was really enjoyable and a really good day. Um, so we had some entries, you might have seen on our socials that we did a competition for a murder she spoke mug or one of a kind even emma and i don't have one <laughs> not yet um, i want one now yeah <laughs> we'll see how much demand there is for them if there's a demand for some merch we could put some out maybe a couple of people offered to buy one genuinely they're like really you got any more of them yeah yeah two people oh, said wow. if you had more of those i would have bought it i was oh. like well okay <laughs> you maybe need to, to get the competition this... i'm afraid yeah Maybe we need to get on this merch gravy chain. Uh, the t-shirts right, okay. are nice that we had made, so you know, yeah. But the but they weren't cheap. That's the only thing, you know. Yeah. When I think of merch, I'm not going to spend like even when we bought them for ourselves. I think we paid like thirty quid for a t-shirt because yeah, we exactly. went for like really nicely printed, nice ones. quality. Yeah. And I'm not convinced other people would pay that. <laughs> Maybe they would. I don't know. Maybe they would. Yeah. No, you're right. Let us I know think you have you to buy in bulk. <laughs> I think you have to buy yeah, in bulk maybe. to get the discounts. Do we have maybe. demand for 500 Murder She Spoke t-shirts? I'm not so sure that we do. <laughs> maybe five. <laughs> yeah. If that. Yeah. Okay, but so... Yeah. the mug was in high demand, so people realised that they had to enter. So in case you've not seen it on socials, uh, we wanted to come up with something a little bit silly or fun. And mm-hmm. we asked people if they were a criminal what would their moniker be so a few people didn't know what that was which was fun and we're like you know in the newspapers or the police or whoever the nickname that they would give you and uh, we also stipulated it had to be pretty low stakes crimes we didn't want any admissions of actual guilt uh we were half joking that if someone came out with something like the Glasgow stabber would have been obliged to tell the police perhaps but um, thankfully they they rose to the occasion and gave us exactly what we were after which was you know free content for the podcast obviously I'm kidding I'm kidding no they were (laughs) very very good there's some fantastic ones that came through so yeah we've got them for you here Mm -hmm. do you want to go first Joe? yeah I'll go first so One of the entries, so we'll read the best entries that we got. So the entries that we had were the Grim Beeper, which was a murderous beekeeper who uses bees to kill people who are allergic to bee stings. It's very niche, isn't it? Yeah, it is. (laughs) We had Panhandler Anderson, the saucy blonde beggar. We had Boston Terrorer. The wee dog shitting with wild abandon. I like that. So it's a Boston Terrier who's yeah. a terror. Yeah, okay, right. Yeah, Go on. yeah, play on that. And then we had Angel of Breath, which is halitosis ridden close talker, which I quite like. That as well. is criminal. Um, that is criminal, I have to say. <laughs> yeah. And okay. Emma, what ones did you have? Yeah, I think the first one of the first ones that came in, we all we all had a bit of a laugh about. Nagatha Christie. She bores her kids into submission and that was by Kate and I thought it was quite clever there's some good puns actually you know there's some good mm-hmm. puns and then another so our winner had also put in some other funny ones as well and this is another one of hers Florence Nightingale, the rogue nurse with a pen knife I love that she had to specify what kind of knife it was as well that was quite that was quite interesting and Another one that I really liked from Kirst, who is actually a volunteer for CrimeCon as well. So she knows all the podcasters and all the crew and Nancy and everyone. And she recognized and came over and had a chat and she was lovely. Now, this, I think, is in a different league in a different way. She has actually come up. There's basically a full story around this. So first of all, she's put Maggie, uh, Magpie Maggie. So that's the nickname. 
I'm like, all right, cool. But then she's she's told us that that magpie Maggie is a serial killer. She's attracted to victims with bling on them. And she leaves black feathers behind at the scene. That is good. That is the that is yeah. the bare bones of a novel there. Like, if someone doesn't run with it, I mean, if you do, please give Cursed some money. Um, but she really thought that through and went with it, and I like that a lot. So, yeah, yeah kudos to Cursed for that one. And then our favourite one, which was a unanimous vote from Bexie Cameron, who was a speaker there. She's an author and a cult survivor, and I'm looking to hopefully get her on the podcast at some point. The Angle of Death the killer geometry teacher <laughs> so that's just so clever she's just great um super interesting person and yeah hopefully we can we can get her on for a chat at some point so yeah crime Com is amazing thanks to everyone who came and spoke to us and said hi uh we it's our first time properly being on podcast row and then especially being asked to go up and do the panel that was really interesting i was quite surprised that our normally confident Joanna was a bit you were you felt <laughs> sick didn't you you felt sick for nerves were going up there yeah I did yeah I did quite nauseous you did beautifully so there was no thank need you to be worried I just say yes to these things and I don't think about them and then when the time comes I'm like oh crap <laughs> yeah that's it though I mean what you weren't going to back out at that point were you so yeah also I think people say that I'm confident but I think maybe that's just a, a front. A lot of the time I'm madly terrified inside. <laughs> yeah, I think my fear, like fearometer is broken because I'm scared of things that I shouldn't be scared of, like needles. Mm. And then things like that or really high heights or all sorts of stuff. It's like that gauge is broken. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, a group of friends. Hello, friends. Let's talk. <laughs> like, I don't know. There's maybe something wrong with me in that sense, but... I guess we've all got to have, there have to be people like me that aren't scared of that in order to have any kind of public speaking or announcements being done, I guess. So, yeah. you know, it is what it is. But yeah, you did amazingly. No one would ever have known that you were remotely anxious. So well done. Thank and you. And yeah, thanks That's to everyone to that, that was there. And our winner of the tickets in the evening was there. We didn't get to see her properly, but we'll need to try and catch up with her another time. But um, we did have a little message back and forth. So sorry we missed you, Katie. Um, we'd been there since like, what were you there? Half seven in the morning? Yeah, 8 a.m., something like that. Yeah. It was a long day. <laughs> it was a long day. So we'd ended up, um, we were pretty tired and we were going to grab some food. And I was a saddo and didn't stay for the quiz. So <laughs> I went home. <laughs> I got I got some food delivered and then I went home. Like the older lady I seem to be nowadays <laughs> <laughs> no it was awesome so yeah definitely recommend for next day. year we are hopefully going to be there again I would have thought unless something happens um I don't see that happening so yeah hopefully be there and we should be able to get discount codes and all that kind of stuff but yeah everyone that everyone that went seemed to love it to bits so yeah really chuffed yeah good feedback definitely yeah, definitely so, um, any recommendations or do you want to, have you got, what case have you got for us this week? I don't have any recommendations for us this week, but I'm happy just to jump straight into this week's case. It's an interesting one and I think that you're going to enjoy it and hopefully our listeners will too. So this week's case is Marion Ross. Is it familiar to you at all, Emma? No, and you told me I wasn't allowed to Google it, so <laughs> I don't know anything. <laughs> Yeah, don't let you to have spoilers. <laughs> okay, so I'll just jump right in. So 51-year-old Marion Ross was a quiet woman who lived alone in a bungalow in Irvine Road in Kilmarnock. Marion previously worked as a bank clerk for the Royal Bank of Scotland, but had since retired. Marion's neighbour described her as a lovely woman who wouldn't hurt a fly. She was a spinster who liked to live a very private life. She never gossiped or hurt anyone. From reports I've read, it seems that Marion lived with her parents and inherited the home when they died. Marion's friend, who had known Marion since she was 16, said she was a very nervous and lonely person. Maureen said, I often felt she missed out on life, but there was nothing I could do about it. She loved gardening and reading books, but she was very private. 
Sadly, I am unable to find much more information about who Marion was as a person. That's always a bit rubbish, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. And that's always a bit rubbish when you can't find anything. It's always a bit disappointing. Sad. Yeah, Yeah, definitely. So around 6pm on 8th of January 1997, Marion was found murdered. Her body was discovered in the bathroom of her home. Her ribs had been crushed and she had been stabbed in the eye and throat with a pair of scissors and a knife had also been used to stab her in the throat. Her ribs have been crushed, like Mm -hmm. like someone had their body weight on her or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. Okay. Neighbour Isabella Gemmel said she feared that her house was being broken into when her terrier dog started barking loudly around 3.30am on the day Marion died. She said, I thought something was funny and I heard a thumping noise from next door. It was unusual because I've never heard anything before from there. When I looked out the back in the morning, our bin had been moved and it looked as if someone had been going through it. But I didn't suspect anything was wrong with Marion. Pathologist Professor Peter Vanetzis would later tell the High Court in Glasgow at the trial for Marion Ross's murder that when she was brought into the mortuary, the scissors used to stab her were still embedded in the front of her throat, right up to the handles. The wound was tracked upwards at a 45 degree angle, five inches deep, and had actually gone into her spine. The wound in her eye had penetrated the base of her skull and had gone into her brain. Alongside the brutal injuries inflicted on Marion were markings on her face and neck and injuries to her hand assumed to be defensive wounds. Seven of Marion's left ribs and six of her right ribs had been fractured. Following the discovery of Marion's body, police and forensics arrived at her home. The crime scene was secured and the names of everyone leaving and entering were logged. CID officer Detective Constable Shirley Cardwell, later McKee, was one of several officers assigned to the case. On the 9th of January 1997, DC Cardwell and a detective sergeant visited the crime scene, but did not enter the home beyond the front porch. DC Cardwell made two further visits to the crime scene to collect documents from officers on the scene, but again did not enter into Marion's home. Police established through their investigation that Marion Ross was very security conscious and as there had been no apparent forced entry into her home, they believed her killer was known to her. 20-year-old David Asbury first came to the attention of the police when his worried mother reported he had disappeared on 13th of January 1997 and had left a note for his family. Along with the note was a gold crucifix and instructions on where to find his money. Asbury returned to his home in Kilburnie, which is 20 miles from Kermarnock, the following day and came under suspicion of police when they discovered he had worked with his grandfather on an extension to Marion's home two years earlier. Asbury and his grandfather had spent 14 weeks completing the building work and it is believed that during this time, Asbury became aware that Marion kept large sums of money around her home. DC Cardwell and a detective sergeant paid a visit to Asbury's home the same day he returned, 14th of January 1997, and discovered a Marks and Spencer's tin in his bedroom which contained around £1,800 in cash. The tin was left in situ and the senior investigating officer in the case was informed of their findings. DC Cardwell and her colleague both handled the tin. Therefore, both submitted their prints for elimination purposes. The same day, a fingerprint was preserved at the crime scene taken from the bathroom door frame. During the police investigation, prints of James and William Campbell, Marion's cousins, were also found in her home. James Campbell's prints were found on the bathroom door which led to extensive police questioning. James worked as a security guard and provided details of his movements on the day Marion died, which were challenged by police. They subsequently searched his house, dug up his garden and sent most of his clothing away for forensic testing as part of their investigation. 
James was found to have had access to Marion's house and discrepancies in his work logs led police to consider him a prime suspect in the case. William Campbell, who did odd jobs in gardening for Marion, was also questioned about his movements at the time of the murder and why his prints were found on a vacuum cleaner near the body. His explanation to police was that he had repaired the hoover for his cousin. He also had to explain to police the origin of a tiny blood stain found in his home. Can I just ask a question? Mm-hmm. Not really a question, but unless the unless the Hoover, the vacuum cleaner, was the murder weapon, and they know he does odd jobs, and he's related to her, it doesn't seem that wild that someone's handprints are on the Hoover. Like you're not going to murder someone and then think I'm going to clean up a bit with the Hoover and leave your prints yeah. on it. And it like it's a really strange mm-hmm. thing to cause loads of suspicion like yeah this is really suspicious a man hoovering is that what they're trying to say like where are they going with this <laughs> I mean, it could be to be fair <laughs> I mean, yeah when was this the 90s yeah so they're like yeah this man could never have been hoovering he must have had an ulterior motive <laughs> it's ridiculous yeah during the investigation police and forensic experts discovered 428 fingerprints at the murder scene of which 235 were so incomplete and fragmented they couldn't identify their owners. Many prints were found to belong to tradesmen who had worked in Marion's home over the years. Officers further attended the home of David Asbury on 16th January 1997 to interview him and obtain fingerprints for elimination. On the 21st of January, Asbury's prints were found on a Christmas gift tag in Marion's living room. Police returned to his residence in Kilburnie the following day with a search warrant and obtained the ornamental tin previously discovered by DC Cardwell and her colleague. It was found to contain bundles of notes. The following day, Asbury was arrested and charged on suspicion of Marion Ross's murder. During initial police questioning, the accused gave a no-comment interview. However, he subsequently admitted the day before the murder his car had broken down a hundred yards from Marion's house. The explanation he gave to police was that Marion had let him in to use the phone and afterwards showed him the extension he had helped to build. Marion Ross's fingerprints were subsequently found to be on the ornamental tin obtained from Asbury's home. In early February 1997, DC Cardwell was notified that her prints were found to be a match with the fingerprint taken from the bathroom door frame at the crime scene on 14th of January 1997. Did she not not go inside? That's correct. DC Cardwell had not entered the crime scene beyond the porch, nor had she visited the home previously. Despite emphasising that the prints could not be hers, the Scottish Criminal Records Office maintained that her prints were found at the scene. Though this discovery did lead to subsequent significant events, it is clear that this contributed to the overshadowing of Marion Ross's murder. I've therefore decided not to elaborate on this aspect of the investigation at this stage. Yeah, sorry for the terrible English there. It just kind of burst out. I was like, hang on. She was not at the scene. I can't remember what I said there. I think I said, was she not not at the scene? Oh, right. (laughs) That's fine. Just to confuse anyone. (laughs) On 16th of May 1997, David Asbury went on trial charged with the murder of Marion Ross. The court heard that when detectives searched Asbury's home, they found a house-shaped ornamental tin in a red toolbox. It contained a hundred bundles of money which had been rolled up in a peculiar way. Marion's former Royal Bank of Scotland colleague, Linda Thompson, was shown photographs of the bundles and said they were wrapped the same way Marion used to do when she worked as a teller. David Asbury's stepfather, William Crisp, gave evidence at the trial. In his evidence, he testified that he had brought the tin box home three years earlier when he worked for a skip hire company in Barhead, Renfrewshire. He said the box was one of a number dumped in the yard and he took several home and gave the ornamental box in the shape of a house to his younger son, Stephen, and another box to David. 
When asked by William Totten, defending, if he was surprised to see the tin in David's room, he said he was not and recognised it right away. He added that his younger son told him a few weeks earlier that he had swapped the tin with David a couple of years prior. Stephen, six, said he could neither remember getting the tin nor swapping it, but he knew it happened because his father had told him. That's weird, isn't it? Did Doesn't look the good. police women know any of that family? I don't think so. During the trial, Asbury also testified that the ornamental tin found in his home had been there for the past three years and contained his life savings. He had no explanation as to how Marion's fingerprint came to be on it. When asked to explain the peculiar way the notes were tied up with elastic bands, Asbury said his father bundled his notes the same way and had shown him how to do it. He said the cash was to have been spent on a new car. In relation to the note he left on the day he disappeared, Asbury claimed he wrote it not because he was befuddled by the terrible thing he had done, but because he was a wee bit depressed and wasn't thinking straight. In relation to the accused being at Marion's home the day prior to her murder, Asbury testified that his car had broken down 100 yards from her home and he had known her due to the previous building work he had carried out two years prior. He stated that Marion had let him into her home to use her phone and claimed that after picking up the phone, he realised his car might not have broken down because of a mechanical failure, but because it needed petrol. As a result, he put down the phone. When asked to explain how his print was found on the gift tag, Asbury said the Christmas present had been lying near the phone with some books and he had moved them aside. During the trial, defence counsel questioned police scenes of crime photographer Leslie Gibbons, who photographed Marion Ross's print on the item in question. William Totten asked how Marion's print could have gotten onto the ornamental tin box, said to have been in Asbury's home for three years, and whether it was possible that, for some reason, someone had brought the tin to Marion's hand after she was dead. Mr Gibbons confirmed from a report that two fingerprints were Asbury's and a third, Miss Ross's, and replied, the possibility is there. Mr Gibbons agreed with Mr Totten that he couldn't say when the prints got onto the box, but confirmed that he took the photographs three weeks after Marion's post-mortem. For clarification, Marion Ross's post-mortem took place on 9th of January, the day after her body was discovered. David Asbury was arrested and the tin box was obtained by police on 22nd of January and the fingerprint evidence from the tin, advises belonging to Marion Ross, was confirmed on 31st of January. I'm really confused about why they are bungling this so badly on so many ways. I don't understand what all the delays and everything are and this is a mess, isn't it? Well, if you think about it, so she was murdered on the 8th of January and I think they were only alerted to David Asbury on the 13th or 14th of January when went missing and left a note. So Even just the things her- like with her being the, you know, the was she a detective or sergeant that not going mm. fully in to gather evidence and I just think if they'd been a lot more tight on things like that, it would be a lot harder mm-hmm. To have those confusing uh, timeline yeah. mix-ups, you know? Yeah, definitely. Especially when someone's been murdered in such a brutal way. Mm-hmm. You'd think they would be trying to do everything to make the case as watertight as possible. I mean, yeah, shouldn't even really be able to be argued that Marion's body could have been used to put the fingers on the tin, that kind of thing. Yeah, like, yeah. It's pretty basic, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Marion's neighbour also testified at the trial, Isabella Monroe, who lived across the road from Marion Ross. She told the court she had never met the stranger before, but after Marion's death, she went to an identification parade and picked out David Asbury. Mrs Monroe revealed that a few months prior to Marion's death, in October 1996, Asbury came to her home and asked for a tow rope. She confirmed that when she told the accused that she didn't have one, he grunted and walked away. Monroe told Alan Dewar, prosecuting, that there was a garage only four houses away and anyone wanting a tow rope would have been aware of its existence. 
When cross-examined by Mr William Totten, defending, Mrs Munro agreed there was nothing about the incident which made her go to the police. But she added that she had an uneasy feeling the young man might have been an opportunist looking for an empty house. Chief Inspector Stephen Heath, who was in charge of the investigation into Marion Ross's murder, was questioned by Mr Alan Dewar, prosecuting, over a suggestion that a print from Miss Ross was planted on a tin money box while she lay in the mortuary. The officer described the allegation made by Asbury's defence counsel, William Totten, several times during the trial as ludicrous and insulting. The trial lasted 13 days and after a two-hour deliberation, the jury found David Asbury guilty of Marion Ross's murder. He was sentenced to life in prison. As previously mentioned, a fingerprint found at the crime scene was confirmed by the Scottish Criminal Records Office as belonging to DC Shirley Cardwell, despite her insistence it couldn't be hers. In 1999, experts outside of the SCRO were consulted and all unanimously agreed the print did not belong to Shirley McKee, formerly Cardwell. This led to the print used to convict David Asbury being called into question and re-examined, also by experts outside of the SCRO. Pat Wertheim, a specialist in fingerprint fabrication in the US, who trained FBI personnel and who had examined Shirley McKee's alleged prints, and Alan Bale, a fingerprint expert formerly of New Scotland Yard, that the print on the tin used to convict David Asbury did not belong to Marion Ross. As such, David Asbury's legal team lodged an appeal against his sentence and he was released on bail in August 2000 after serving three years for Marion's murder pending an investigation. In August 2002, appeal judges quashed David Asbury's conviction for Marion Ross's murder. Mr Asbury's lawyers argued that the evidence of SCRO experts had been substantially discredited they said that Mr Asbury was the victim of a miscarriage of justice. For the Crown, Advocate Deputy Jerry Hanretti, then QC, accepted that there was fresh evidence in the case. He said, It is accepted also that the evidence is significant and accordingly the conviction does fall to be quashed. The Crown conceded that without the flawed forensic evidence, the case against him could not stand and Lord Justice Clark Gill made his unease clear when he said, it is a matter of considerable concern to the court that the administration of justice has got into this position. In 2011, Marion's close friend and neighbour Maureen Stevenson, then 81, said in an interview that she was saddened and sickened that justice had still not been done for her long-term friend almost 15 years on. Maureen said, The whole thing has been an absolute shambles from start to finish, and it all just makes a mockery of Marion's memory. It will be 15 years in January since she was brutally murdered in her own home and the person who did it is still free to roam the streets. Poor Marion has lost her life and justice has still not been done and no one is behind bars. The way she died was awful and still no one has been caught. The investigation into her death and all this carry on about fingerprints has been sickening. It makes my stomach turn. It leaves a bad taste in my mouth that money has changed hands because of Marion's death and that doesn't sit right with me. Justice has not been done for Marion and we are still no further forward in catching the person who committed this terrible crime. The investigation into Marion's murder is now cold and following the exoneration of David Asbury, a police spokeswoman from then Strathclyde Police said the case was not likely to be reopened. She added, Strathclyde Police gathered all the evidence available and submitted a report to the Procurator Fiscal. We will be examining the judgment in due course it is not appropriate for the police to comment on the outcome of the judicial process. Shirley McKee's father, Ian McKee, who was a serving police officer for 37 years, has encouraged the Crown Office to reopen the Marion Ross murder investigation on numerous occasions. Each time the response received is, the murder of Marion Ross remains unsolved and will be subject to regular review by both COPFS and the police. He said... Many questions remain to be answered from the police inquiry and as an ex-police officer, I have many reservations about the investigation. Given the revelations about the fingerprint inquiry, any evidence against David Asbury should now be treated with scepticism. The only established truth is that whenever we start to look at this murder again, 
doubt floods in. Few people realised that there were a number of suspects in this case who were quickly dropped when David Asbury's print was found. We are left to wonder why the Crown Office refuses to take any proactive action and its failure to respond to Chief Constable Stephen House reinforces the belief that it has something to hide. It's time for the Crown Office to settle these matters once and for all, in an honest and open manner, so that the memory of Marion Ross is honoured and there's no resting place for those who brutally ended her life. And that is the case of Marion Ross. That's so, so infuriating. I don't even know where to start. So I they mean, managed it's... to get both fingerprints wrong. Yep. And focus. I mean, I understand, don't get me wrong. I understand why they um, were interested in him. You know, he had been in the house and that kind of thing. But it sounded like she had a lot of people in that house doing work. And then family members and she also knew other people as well. There was quite a few people that she would have trusted to let in the house. So I find it odd. Also, I know what they're saying about the banknotes because my stepdad used to work in a bank and knew how to fold banknotes in a certain way. There's quite a lot of bank tellers out there. <laughs> There's a lot of people that fold notes in that way. It's not mm -hmm. entirely unheard of. Plus, if that guy had been working on her um, her extension, who's to say he wasn't doing other cash and hand jobs and had access to cash? Mm -hmm. It's not uncommon for labourers and the like to do to take cash under the table. Do you know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. yeah, there's just a lot of things that feels like another one of those cases where... To be fair, they did ostensibly believe they had evidence, but even before then, they kind of had a suspect. And then that was it. I mean, you would actually struggle to get a conviction on the basis of one fingerprint nowadays anyway. And then the thing about that, why didn't they query the fact that the policewoman had not been inside and they knew she hadn't been inside and yet that fingerprint was being matched to her? They did. That went off in a whole other direction. And I deliberately didn't cover that for this case because that debacle has overshadowed the Marion Ross murder case and Marion Ross as a person basically since okay. it happened. So I decided not to cover that aspect of the case for this episode because... There was so much drama and detail and it just went off in twists and turns in different directions that I decided to keep the focus on Marion Ross. Oh, for no, this that's episode. totally fair. I mean, it is, it is essentially irrelevant to what happened in the end mm -hmm. if that police woman had nothing to do with it, which it sounds like she didn't have anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. And I do understand just because it's piqued my curiosity that I'm sure it did. Um, interest others but yeah as you said it's not really relevant to actually the crime at hand that's so so sad and disappointing it and, is and it's, um, it, it's sad as well because yeah. even researching the case when I whenever I tried to find information about Marion everything that came up was about the fingerprint debacle with the police officer yeah. I, I do appreciate that the, the murder happened in 1997 so it's not you know it's news archives it's not you know, as freely available information as it would be if it was a more recent case, but it it does seem to have been overshadowed by this. And the fact she was such a quiet person who kept herself to herself as well means that there wasn't a lot of information available about her. So yeah. that's why I wanted to bring a little bit more focus to this because essentially it is a, it's an unsolved case. And I'm guessing they do believe that money was the motive. But it's quite a personal killing. Very, and very brutal. Up close and personal. Very brutal. So they, during the mm. original trial, they deemed that David Asbury had sat on her, obviously, which should cause her ribs to crush. But yeah, it's an incredibly brutal murder. Um, like you say, if robbery 
for a largely small sum of money was the motive. Mm. Something about it doesn't make sense, does it? There's something, there's probably mm. more to it that yeah. if it is solved or looked into, who knows? Feels mm. like there's more to it. Definitely. And I think I can't, I couldn't see any updates from Strathclyde Police is obviously now part of Police Scotland. I couldn't mm -hmm. see any updates from Police Scotland to say that they were actively investigating it or perhaps they would just be waiting on any new information coming in or if it is... I think essentially what they say in Police Scotland is there's no such thing as cold cases. All cases are subject to regular review. I think I have heard that several times. So maybe to call it a cold case isn't fair, but it sounds like they're not maybe actively, actively pursuing right any now. other lines of inquiry. Or if they are, they're they're being very, very quiet about it and not they haven't put I've, out any press very, releases to confirm that. I would be very curious as to who benefited from her passing who was left in the will who got the house personally yeah I didn't find any of that information out when I was researching the case but I had I thought the that, same across my mind interesting because the motive is unclear mm -hmm. yeah and unfortunately humans are often simple creatures mm-hmm and covet what each other have. Yeah. Oh, that's so sad. Yeah. Thank you for covering it, though. Hopefully, if anyone okay. knows anything or perhaps in the future. Yeah, so I, I mean, obviously, they've, that there's an update. They one charged day someone. That we can they give were people. tried and convicted. And then, as I said, the conviction was quashed. So essentially, it is an unsolved case. Um, it is back from 1997, so it was a good while ago now, but. Somebody knows something, you know. How, how old so, as she? usual, how? if anyone has any information, you can contact Police Scotland or Crime Stoppers with any information that you may have, which may contribute to the resolution of this case. So, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. That is really tragic. I just, like I said before, I hope we can get an update for people at some point, but it even feels harder when they've already tried and prosecuted someone and it was wrong I don't know yeah anyway yeah thank you again that was very very interesting it is an interesting I... case isn't it? it yeah massively um and I'd be nice to see a resolution to it follow the red herring down the path and just kept to Marion's story for us so thank you for doing that That's okay. I do have a bit of a silly fun crime thing for us okay low stakes again we're going low stakes love it well not really low stakes monetary wise actually but uh in 2012 a man was arrested in chile for stealing and smuggling about five tons of what i'll let you guess five tons Five tons. Arrested and, and it's perishable. In Chile. It's perishable, I'll give you that. Clue. My first... <laughs> my first thought was rice, but only because I thought of chili con carne. You're so close. Really? Knock the what R off. Ice. Ice. He stole and smuggled five tons of ice from the Jorge Mont Glacier in the Patagonia region, he smuggled ice. He smuggled part of a glacier, which is wild. He had it in a truck and the total value of the ice was estimated to be around $6,100. It's believed to have been destined for Santiago as gourmet polar ice cubes fetch high prices at the upscale bars and restaurants scattered across the capital, and it would appear they don't care how they are obtained. The, the theft of glacial ice has captured popular attention in Chile in recent years, as it's an increasingly valuable commodity in the regions bordering Patagonia. The Jorge Mont Glacier is located in the Bernardo O'Higgins National Park and it is retreating by more than half a mile every year due to both global warming and theft. 
There you go. Oh my God. How strange. Isn't that bizarre? Did he even have like a... I know. Did he even have like a refrigerated lorry or something? I'm hoping he did. I mean, I presume so. But that's why I said perishable. I want to give you a clue because that you can't yeah. just like put that in your pocket and walk away. I honestly don't know. I'm, it must have been. It must have been refrigerated. But then... So how is it valued then? Was that you... just in a was it in a protected region or something? Yes, so you're not allowed to take it from the national parks and the glaciers. Oh, sorry, I yes, believe the national it's... park, right? Yes, it was a glacier inside a national park, and you are not allowed to do it. But also, how unless it's like in Iceland? Because when I went to Iceland, there are chunks that come off the glacier and kind of float out into the sea. Do you mm-hmm. grab one of them and scoop it up? I don't know. How do you, how do you grab? How do you obtain mm. that size of a chunk of ice? I don't. He must have gone in I know with I like one more... of those drills or something. Like a really you know those things scoop. that they use for like breaking up concrete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he's not got a hammer and chisel, is he, for that? No. That's mad. God, he's skating onto the ice there, isn't he? Ice. I've got nothing. I've got nothing. <laughs> I just uh Oh no, you could you should make a joke about chili. Chili. No? Oh, yeah. Nothing chili? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I like I like Yeah, that I was uh Yeah, nice. That's good. So yeah, there you go. But yeah, I can't believe you said rice and I, I thought you said ice for a split second and I was like, no way has she just guessed that. No mm. way. <laughs> like it's such a I would have been I would, I would have only because I thought of chili con yeah, carne when you said a, chili. And I thought chili yeah. con and rice. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Even though, yeah, <laughs> I mean, My very gosh. tenuous, but I'll, I'll give you it. So yeah, there you go. What people pay money for these days as well, like ice from a bloody glacier. Like, what the hell? I'm not judging anyone. Last year, when I was pregnant, I bought bags of pre-made ice from the the supermarket when I have perfectly good ice cube making implements in my own home but I was lazy mm. and unable to I know, do I so. buy ice I mean, as well. Hugo crunched through I mean we, we I don't know how many bags of ice Hugo and I went through it was just like one for him and then one for me so <laughs> yeah we, we we are we are also funding the demand for ice globally so maybe we've played into this horrendous crime Perhaps. in some way <laughs> yeah, yeah. Got a lot, lot to answer to Emma. It's, it's the kind of crime I would be involved in. Really, it's pretty low stakes. It's a bit weird. It's a bit off the wall. Nobody's really hurt. If you start, if you start buying like glacier ice online, we're gonna have to have words. <laughs> I'm just sitting here recording, just clinking my drink at you menacingly, like with my illegal. It's ice. not just ice. Yeah, it's, it's glacier ice. It's not, it's not gonna... <laughs> Chili and glacier ice. <laughs> Do you think it tastes better if it's illegal? Or do you think it's for... Do you know what it might be for? I'm now realising. It might actually be more for those ice sculptures rather than... Did it not say they were using it to serve in... Did no, it just said bars and restaurants. No? It said bars and restaurants. It said for I just assumed it mean in drinks. But then... Right. I don't know if people would really know. Or if it exactly. tastes any different. Do you know what I mean? Would I you reckon like they're your... using it for displays. Yeah. Would you like your must be. vodka and coke with regular ice or glacier ice? One is $5, the other one is $25. Like, and would it taste any different? Who knows? Exactly. I don't know. It's going to all just gonna melt just, and dilute your alcohol anyway. Yeah. I don't know. And I'm just thinking like today's world with glacier ice just have like bits of microplastic in it. Probably. Very likely. Yeah. Polar bear shit. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, maybe not in Chile, actually. <laughs> to the back. Maybe not in Chile. Maybe not. But yeah, very odd. There you go. There's your um, fun crime for the week. Okay. Thank you so much for that. So I think that's us for this week. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.